Hello, good evening and welcome to our talk tonight on skiing. Um, so we're going to have two speakers tonight and they'll both join us afterwards for a live Q&A. Um, so any of you that don't know this, I'm Fiona Rota, I'm the Business Development Manager here in the Sports Surgery Clinic. Um, so we are uh, situated about 10 minutes from Dublin Airport. We're just off the M50 and the M1. We're a leading orthopaedic clinic and we're internationally and nationally renowned. We're, um, we're leaders in hip replacement, knee replacement, shoulder replacement. We also look after spinal surgery, shoulder surgery, elbows, hands, knees, really everything. And soft tissue injury like the ACL and we do knee arthroscopy. You'll hear a bit more about the knees during the talks. Um, hopefully you won't need us after your skiing holiday, but um, Brian Devitt will be talking more about those ACLs. So we have three MRIs here and a CT scanner with a state-of-the-art um, physiotherapy and sports medicine department. We've over 30 uh, orthopedic consultants and all our physiotherapists, nurses and strength and conditioning coaches are, are specialized in orthopedics and MSK. So tonight, we, like I said, the, the Neil, Dr. Neil Welsh and Professor Brian Devitt are gonna join us live for a Q&A after the presentation. Now you'll see a tab there, ask a question. So if you can type in your question, we will endeavor to get through them all tonight if we can. And if any come in late, we can also um, send you responses tomorrow. You'll also see another tab there for other events. So you will be able to go in and see this afterwards, or if you want to direct any friends to watch this afterwards, it will be up on our website. Now there are other events on there that we've done in the past that might be of interest to you. Uh, like golf um, events, hiking, um, running, um, all those kind of sports injuries, which you can go in and have a look at as well. And we do have future events there that will be happening. We have a golf evening in March of this year. So the first speaker tonight is Professor Brian Devitt. And Brian's going to be talking about the knee injury, and it's called Apres Ski. And then uh, there'll be a second presentation after that. And I'll see you then. Good evening. My name is Brian Devis. Uh, I'm Professor of Orthopaedics here at UPMC Sports Surgery Clinic, and I'm a knee surgeon. So the title of my talk this evening is Apre Knee, Prevention and Management of Knee Injuries on the Ski Slopes. So now that many of you are uh, going away to um, ski resorts, this is some hopefully some salient information that should help you uh, on your journey and try to avoid some ski injuries. So I'm just going to start off with a video. This video is a, a classic example of what happens on a ski slope. So you have friends who are laughing at you falling, but oftentimes the fall is, a, is an injury. So I just want you to hear what happens now as this skier comes down the slope. You hear that snap? Well, if you look at the, the person, that snap is not the skis coming off. That snap is the ACL rupturing. And you see that the individual is coming down a slope, probably at too high speed, and leaning back onto his skis. And that's what's causing the, the, the injury. And this is a classic example of how an ACL ruptures on a ski. So I was lucky enough as part of my um, fellowship training that I was away in Vail, Colorado, which is a ski, a ski resort. And one of the uh, forefathers of treatment of ski injuries is this man here, Dr. Dick Stedman. And unfortunately he passed away just last year. But he described the ski as the ideal device to rupture an ACL. So really you have to be cautious when we're using skis because they, there are a high rate of knee injuries associated with skiing. In terms of skiing, it's good for our business because people go away and injure themselves. It's a hugely popular sport. You see nowadays many people are heading away to the slopes as holidays become a little bit more accessible. Um, and it's a, it's a very enjoyable pursuit for the whole family. But it is a risky sport. And we see here just the idea of the type of knee injuries we get. So 35%, the majority of injuries occur in the knee. And that relates to what Dick Stedman said about the ski, because it's a high torque um, object that you, you twist at your knee because your boots are held in place. But you also get other, other injuries uh, associated with skiing. The equipment has changed markedly over the 100 years or so people have been skiing. And what you see here, the old fashioned skis where people had a much lesser binding and the boots weren't as high uh, on the ankle as they are nowadays. 
you see the modern boot is the it goes up to the um, two thirds the way up your shin and your ankles are essentially fixed that it just allows a bit of flexion and extension at the ankle but very little rotation so the rotation doesn't occur at the at the ski the rotation tends to occur at the knee and that's what happens in terms of getting acl injuries the um you'll often hear and the people getting skis and then getting bindings and the bindings are tightened up so when you go to an instructor or sorry, an instructor or a person who's um, giving you your skis they would often talk about the din and the din relates to how tight the boot is fixed to the ski so when you have are a very aggressive skier you want your boots to be really tightly fixed to your ski but when you're a more novice skier you want your boots to be able to come away from your ski so if you have any suspicion or suggestion of knee problems you should probably get your din fit very low so your ski comes away from your boot and you don't turn your your boot uh, and your knee and cause an acl injury so the terrain and conditions are also very important if you notice that the individual fell in very deep snow but equally if you have icy snow or very slushy snow they can grab your skis and be at higher risk of injury and unpredictable behavior from people who are on holiday probably drinking a bit too much and uh, or potentially just being a bit risky uh, on holiday, they can cause collision to have injuries, which can often give rise to um, to injuries themselves. So if we look at the example here, this is from uh, Deer Park in Utah, um, where they give an example of how people cause uh, have injuries. And they tend to be novice skiers where they're leaning backwards and they're not leaning down the mountain as we're instructed. And that creates the skier to be off balance. The hips tend to be below your knees. The uphill ski is unweighted and then you tend to fall on the inside uh, of the uh, edge of the ski uh, and this causes the injury. So this causes your knee to be in a vulnerable position as the ski twists. As I said, the unpredictable behavior, it's great fun and the apres ski, but it's also when you're coming down the mountain with a few pints on board and you don't have that neuromuscular control you perhaps had in the morning or perhaps even in the morning you're a bit hungover and you're going skiing. It does increase the risk of injury, unfortunately. <laughs> And unfortunately, you just can't legislate for stupidity. So there's many things you can do. And this is an example of unpredictable behavior. So on the mountain, what can you do? For first of all, primum non notre is the phrase we have in medicine to first cause no harm. So you really want to be um, make sure you, you're skiing within your your area of expertise. So you don't want to go outside of your lane or ski in an area that you're perhaps going to get stuck in, but also go down a, a slope that you are um, not able to ski. You're much more likely to get injured or more, worse, even you know get lost or die or fall off a cliff. So that just goes with common sense, just to ski within your, your area of expertise. Also avoid hazardous conditions. So particularly if it's snowing or you're not a very good skier and you have very low light, it's very hard to see the undulations on the ground and that can make you more likely to fall over. So even on a flat slope, it's really difficult you have a whiteout. So beware of the hazard, uh, hazardous conditions. And also be available, well able to stop before you start. So this is an, an example of another collision type injury, but someone a little bit out of control. So skiing is a hazardous sport. You need to stay away from people who are unpredictable and get back into your comfort zone. So stay on the slopes if you're not so uh, skilled to go off the slopes. So in the clinic, what, what do we do? Well, one of the, this article I often quote in my talks is by um, uh, a very eminent Professor Apley, and he talks about intelligent kneemanship and doing appropriate examination is, is very important. But prior to that is taking a, a history. So typically an individual who injures their knee in history is skiing down a slope, has a fall, tends to hear a snap as we heard in the opening video, but then is has difficulty putting the ski back on and skiing down the mountain. So you know it's a more serious injury when someone is taken off the mountain by the ski patrol. But what typically happens is to go to the, skin, the clinic at the end of the mountain they get an x-ray and they get a very overpriced knee brace and then they're sent on their way. And, but in terms of taking the history, you can really tell what's gone on from the, the fall, the crack that people tend to hear. That's very indicative. When you're doing a clinical examination, we look for um, 
a number of features and you often compare to the, the normal knee because it gives you a good idea of what's going on. But we're looking for the presence of swelling within the knee and swelling following an injury is typically blood. So it's bleeding because you've torn something and very commonly it's your ACL. So that's really important to look at the other knee. And you see yourself when you take off your salopets that one knee looks swollen. It's probably something you should get assessed. In terms of the uh, clinical examination, we go through in a very systematic manner to assess all of the ligaments around your knee. So the ligaments on the side of your knee, so you can often injure the medial ligament or inside ligament. The, the, uh, the ACL is, is very commonly injured, so you'll see a very swollen knee, as you see in this situation here. And oftentimes in the ski um, medical uh, facilities, they're very limited, they're quite primitive. So what they typically do is simply an x-ray to outrule a fracture and that's very important but the clinical examination will determine whether you have a very severe knee injury which may have more than one ligament injured or whether it's a a more routine knee injury with just a solitary ligament and that has big implications a lot of times they'll try to sell you a brace and oftentimes the brace is not needed but then they will say, well, let's get an MRI scan or let's have surgery early on occasion. And this used to happen occasionally in the US. And I would advise against this. I think that in the cold light of day, you can get further investigations when you come home and get appropriate treatment that's not under pressure or under the coercion by people trying to make money. So it's very important to consider that. The x-ray is example here can show you uh, what a little flake of bone coming off from the side of the, the tibia and that's an example of what we call a Sagan fracture, and that's indicative of an ACL injury. The MRIs can be done oftentimes in the ski mantis are poor quality, but in this situation, you can see some bruising at the uh, mid portion of the tibia, and all, sorry, the femur, and also the back of the tibia. And this is indicative of a, a, an injury that causes an ACL rupture. You can do ultrasound scans, and these are cheap uh, scans to get, and they often are effective for looking at ligament injury on the side of the knee. And then referral. Um, so the referral is, is very important. So getting back to, to your, your home country is, is key and being packaged and getting back uh, safely. So uh, that's that's very important. So as I said, in the cold light of day, this, this is when we really yeah, should see people when we can just assess them appropriately. We take away the, the drama, we get them back where they're comfortable and the anxiety is lessened, they speak the language and we can explain things and get the appropriate investigation. So early diagnosis is important. We need to know what we're dealing with. But oftentimes with knee injuries, we don't have to rush into surgery. And sometimes if you have a decreased range of motion or your muscles aren't working properly, delayed management is much more appropriate. We then also discuss the um, treatment. Not all knee injuries require surgery. And I often tell people they should try to avoid surgery if they can. But certain situations will warrant surgery and we'll go through all of the options with you in, a, in the cold light of day. We remove the splints as soon as possible. And a lot of times these splints are unnecessary, particularly when they keep a knee straight, that joints are designed to move. And really, we don't like keeping them straight unless it's a really serious um, fracture that has to be stabilized for most ligament injuries. If, they're, if the knee is not very unstable, you can move them. And that's really important. Um, and getting being ready for surgery is dependent on range of motion. So that's really key. And that's the first thing we, we do. We also get people to weight bear as tolerated. That cartilage doesn't take a joke and cartilage doesn't like um, not being loaded. So it's really important that we would get you back weight bearing as soon as possible. Because if you are to have any knee surgery, we typically get you weight bearing very quickly afterwards. So it's very important that you're able to do this before surgery. So that's one of the things that people do. They get assessed, they get moving and get back to their normal activities. So I'm just going to go through a few common scenarios. And these come into my clinic all the time, much more frequently at this time of year as people come back from, from ski holidays. So I'm going to start off with a novice snowboarder. So I'm just going to read out the type of referral I get. So thank you, Brian, for seeing Ben, a 14-year-old snowboarder who had an injury one week ago. He doesn't recall the mechanism, but there was swelling within 12 hours of his injury, and he was only able to toe touch weight bear. So just put his toe to the ground. He was unable to extend his knee. So you know that there's some perhaps some food in the knee. Uh, an X-ray of plain film was unremarkable, except for some fluid within the knee. And an MRI was performed, which showed a small fracture to the uh, inside of the knee and a sprain to the medial ligament. Also sprain to the uh, ACL. 
He's currently in a brace and I've advised him to non-weight bear. His mother will bring the films with her. So this is a very common condition we, we get. So in terms of the history, it was a contact injury turning and he didn't feel a pop. He fell to the ground. He was unable to weight bear and he was taken off the hill. No immediate swelling, but swelling within the first 12 hours. We know that something serious has happened. On clinical examination, then, he held his knee in a flex position, so unable to activate the muscles at the front of the knee. He was walking with the limp. He did have normal alignment, which is important, and some swelling within the knee is was what we diagnosed. And then he was unable to straighten his knee by 10 degrees, but had good flexion, and uh, then had a one degree uh, laxity or a uh, slight sense of instability of his medial ligament. And he had a negative Lachman test. So that means that his ACL felt intact. So if we look at the um, x-rays here, we see that this is a juvenile because he still has growth plates and there's no evidence of any uh, fractures on these uh, uh, x-rays. So that's very reassuring. And then the um, X MRI was performed. And this is what we see in MRI. We look for the presence of whiteness on MRI. So that indicates fluid on these sequences. So we see on the inside of the knee, the fluid is in this region of the medial ligament here on the inside of the knee. And we see that the ACL is this ribbon-like structure in the middle. And he does have a little bit of fluid in the knee, so we know that there's been some damage, but the ACL in this situation looks intact, which would be in keeping with the clinical examination findings. So this individual was just treated um, uh, non-operatively and allowed to get on their way. So they escaped a major injury, which is which is very good. So that was a very common scenario we'd see. A lot of times we just give people reassurance, but we assess them thoroughly to the proper investigations. So this is the second scenario, an experienced skier. So had a history of a high speed fall turning on a steep slope. So akin to the first person we saw in the video, heard a loud pop. Hopefully his friends weren't teasing him as he fell like the other individual. Tried to stand, but the knee buckled had to be removed from the mountain by the ski patrol, uh, patrol and had immediate swelling. On clinical examination, once again, when you have swelling, you typically are unable to straighten your knee. So people will see that a lot. Couldn't weight bear, couldn't stand on the leg. Big, big effusion and what we call ecchymosis. So that's bruising. We like using fancy words for for and uh, for bruising. And um, so ecchymosis on the e medial side, the inside of the knee, bruising on the inside of the knee. He then had a grade three laxity. So he had a huge amount of opening of the medial collateral ligament and the test for the ACL was positive. So we would suspect this is a more multi-ligamentous injury based on the bruising, the swelling and the laxity that we assessed at the time of, of, of clinic. So if you look at the x-rays here, so we didn't say which side, but I presume it's the right knee, but the x-rays show this area uh, of a little bit of bone here. You see that on the x-ray. So that would indicate that this person has a high uh, uh, has sustained an ACL injury, but po possibly a higher grade injury than the, the uh, aforementioned uh, snowboarder. OK, so they'll go on then to have um, a further um, investigations. So this is the um, the MRI, MRI we see. So this is MRI looking at the side of the knee. We see lots of um, fluid within the knee. So this whiteness is, is blood. We also can see some bruising. So the, the color of bone normally on these scans is this dark gray or black color. And this area is a lighter gray here. So there's lots of um, fluid within the bone or what we call bone bruising. And you can see uh, you, the meniscus, which is this black structure, is hanging off at the back of the knee. So we know that this knee is further far forward. So there's something has been ruptured in this case. And as we look into the middle of the knee, we see that the ribbon-like structure that we saw previously has been ruptured. So this is the ACL, which is torn. So thankfully, um, this person has got the appropriate imaging and we have to get the appropriate management, but there is a definite pair of the ACL here, as you can see. And then we look at the inside, the knee from the front, and we see that here where you like to see a nice black ligament, that that's just this gray color. So we know that the medial collateral ligament has torn off as well. And that would be in keeping with the laxity or the feeling of looseness of that inside ligament. So that's a, a serious, more serious condition. And that's a condition that would require um, ACL reconstruction and probably medial collateral ligament repair or reconstruction. That's a more operative case because it's a higher grade injury. So finally, we get a recreational skier. skier. So uh, a twisted knee removing the boot from the binding. So that's a very unfortunate 
um, type of scenario. But it's it's a common scenario, particularly when you're tired, where you're twisting your leg, you're frustrated, you're trying to get your boots out, which feel cumbersome. Felt a crunch in the knee. The, he skied on. He said it was fine after a wine. So maybe a little bit of self-medication there. It's no harm. Uh, very painful that night. So this is very typical of an injury that happens during the day. You get more pain in the evening. Lasted the week through gritted teeth. So they probably drank a bit of wine, was able to ski on. And then in the cold light of day, they're uncomfortable. So they come to see us. So on examination, the alignment is normal. So they stand with straight legs. Some small evidence of any fluid and effusion is the word we use for that. Full range of motion, but pain at the end range. So when they're fully extending their knee or flexing their knee, it was painful. Pain on the inside of the knee and then a, a normal ligaments examination. So we're not suspicious of any ligament injury here, but might be suspicious of an injury to the soft tissue within the knee. And this is the side view we see of this person's knee. And what we're looking at is the, uh, the meniscus. So the crunching sensation with twisting is very commonly a meniscal injury. So we see here is the, the meniscus, and it should be like a black triangle, but you see this white line going through the black triangle at the back. And so what they've done is they've torn the meniscus. And oftentimes people describe this as being fine at rest, but when they walk downstairs or twist or get in and out of a car, they find some pain. And I often tell people it's like it's analogous to having a stone in your shoe. If the stone is sitting under your toes, it doesn't cause any problem. When it moves under the ball of your foot, that's when it really lifts you out of it. And that's similar to a meniscus. When that flap moves, that can often give an awful lot of pain. So we try to treat this non-operatively to begin with, but if the pain or symptoms are persisting beyond uh, three months or there's very obvious signs, signs of displacement on uh, MRI scan, then we would often have to do an arthroscopy and just remove that uh, torn portion of the meniscus. Okay, so this is just another example of, of that where you see the meniscus is just pushed out to the side there and there's some displacement. Okay, so that's it. So um, from my perspective, um, I hope you stay safe on the ski slopes and take some advice. And uh, I'm sure Neil has given you some great advice to get fit before you get on the ski, ski slopes. But go and enjoy yourself. Be safe. But if you do run into any problems, we'll be here to see you and to treat you appropriately. Thank you very much. Hi, welcome back. And thanks, Brian, for that presentation. So just before the next presentation, um, just to remind you, we are part of UPMC now, and there is a UPMC network around the country with hospitals, Whitfield in Waterford, or even in Kilkenny and Clane in Kildare. And also they have uh, a number of sports medicine facilities around the country. So there is a tab there that you can see UPMC. So just if you are living in other parts of the country and you do need to make appointments, you can use that as well. So remember the tab there for ask a question, so please type in your questions. And that Neil Welsh and Brian Devitt will join us live after Neil's talk um, for a live Q&A. So here is the next presentation about fitness for skiing, and it's Dr. Neil Welsh. Thank you. Hi there, everyone. Uh, my name is Neil Welch. I oversee um, the, the testing and lab services at the UPMC Sports Surgery Clinic in Santry. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today um, about getting fit for your for your skiing holiday in two weeks' time. We am going to expand on that a little bit as well as we go through. Um, what I think it is worth doing is is kind of revisiting skiing a little bit. Um, so I'm just going to show you a, a clip here um, of what the very highest level looks like. But what I wanted you to do is just to get a bit of a, a sense of some of the forces that are involved during skiing, the, the movements that we have to to undertake. Oftentimes, I think we perceive skiing as quite a, a leisurely activity, but um, the harder we ski, the, the higher the intensity the exercise becomes. So we can see the, the amount of strength that's required in order to be able to put weight onto the ski, in order to be able to create turns. We can see here in slow motion the, the body positions that are required and the, um, the flexibility that's, uh, that's needed in order to be able to position um, ourselves in order to make, make a turn. And okay, none of us is, is going to be skiing this fast on our holiday. But I think it just gives you a bit of a sense, um, or the aim of it is to give you a bit of a sense that it's, it's a relatively tough physical activity that we're undertaking. So the, the big question, um, possibly uh, one we, we've tuned in for for, uh, for this talk, how do I get fit for skiing in two weeks? Uh, well, the answer is you don't. 
Um, now, don't worry, the talk isn't going to end there. Um, what I'm going to do is hopefully give you a few tips where you can get a little bit fitter and a little bit more prepared if you have left it to the last minute, um, but hopefully help you to build some behaviours um, that you can uh, you can build into your uh, weekly lifestyle, I guess, um, and, and prepare you for any kind of future endeavours. So the aims, um, I want to highlight the physical demands of skiing and snowboarding. And when I'm talking skiing, I'm, I'm going to encompass both sports. I'm going to give you some specific guidance uh, to help you get fitter prior to your holiday. And then also help you um, plan in order to be able to get fitter before you go and, and maybe um, stay fitter um, uh, throughout your day-to-day -day life. Okay, and why can I talk about this stuff? Um, well, it seems like a very long time ago, and it, well, it is uh, 15 years ago, I, I was working as a strength and conditioning coach with the uh, England's development ski team. Um, my role there was to help prepare the, uh, the skiers for the physical demand of their sport. Um, so I have a couple of uh, photos here from, um, from some training camps. Um, the English ski team isn't the best funded, and it might surprise you to learn. Um, uh, and so the facilities we had, uh, had available were um, uh, homemade. So what you see on the left is uh, a gym uh, we, we built in, in the garage of the accommodation we were staying at. Also served as a bit of a, a, a kit room and a ski prep area. Um, and on the, the right hand side, this is an early, um, early year camp. Now, ski racing is a little bit different in terms of the, the snow demand. We actually quite like hard pack in that icy conditions. So uh, early season training camps aren't a problem. Uh, this is a resort in Italy called San Sicario, um, where we go, uh, go out and try and marry some of the, um, uh, what we call the dry land conditioning. So the, uh, uh, the off snow stuff alongside some of the, uh, the preparations for the, the technical training. And um, so I've got a, a pretty decent um, understanding of the, the physical demands of the sport from, um, from that work. Now, that said, there are some very specific challenges that we um, uh, have to negotiate when we're going on a ski holiday. Um, so the first is that we only do it for one, maybe two weeks a year if we're, if we're very lucky. Um, what that means is it's very difficult to specifically condition for skiing when you only do it for five or six days per year. Um, so that offers its, its own demands. Oftentimes, and this is certainly um, off the back of speaking to patients who, who we might see come through the clinic, um, often there's very little physical preparation. Um, some of us um, very much see uh, going skiing as a, as a holiday. Um, we don't necessarily change our behaviours, and um, certainly some of us are quite sedentary in those behaviours. So we're moving into an activity that is quite physical off the back of, um, of doing a lot less physical activity prior to that. Then the, the makeup of the holiday itself, you know, you buy a lift ticket for five or six days. Um, we don't like to see that money go to waste, and so we're going to ski back-to-back -back days. Essentially, you're doing the equivalent of getting running shoes on and, and trying to run a 10K for five or six days on the bounce. Um, and we all know we'd find that incredibly challenging. We then throw into the mix oftentimes reduced sleep. So whether that's um, uh, self-induced uh, um, uh, through enjoyment on a holiday or potentially um, uh, children not settling into a, to a different routine, um, that is often impacted. Um, and then inad inadequate recovery. So a bucket of melted cheese and um, a few pints or glasses of red wine isn't always the best recovery, recovery from a, a day's physical activity. So these are some of the innate challenges that we have when we go away. The physical demand of the scheme, uh, relatively straightforward. I'm not going to go into huge, uh, huge depth here. <clears throat> but we saw in the video there, we need to create pressure on the boot and the ski in order to be able to initiate the turn. That requires some force and, and hence some strength. Then in order to be able to hold our edge during the turn, um, we have to undergo what we call eccentric contractions to be able to tolerate those forces. So the strength demand, particularly on the, the bottom ski on each turn. Um, and then we have some of the demands of um, the, the holiday itself. So being able to tolerate multiple runs. And oftentimes some of us want to ski as many vertical meters as we can. We have tracking apps for that. We do a top to run bottom. So we want to do multiple runs each day and we want to do that on consecutive days. And the stronger you are, the better you're able you are to tolerate those um, uh, that, that level of activity and that volume of uh, physical activity. On the other side of the coin, we have fitness. So there's an aerobic demand to skiing. Um, so we, we know that when we get to the bottom of a run, we can feel out of breath. And again, the, the faster we ski and the more intense we ski, the more out of breath we do get. Um, aerobic uh, capacity also helps us to recover between runs. So skiing isn't purely aerobic. There's an anaerobic element to it which is where we talk about building up metabolites. People talk about building up lactate in muscle. 
Um, and the, our aerobic uh, system helps us to clear that and recover between runs. So being fit is important to be able to tolerate that. And then, um, again, depending on the resort we select, many of us will select a resort um, at higher altitude to be slightly more snowshore. Um, so we are going to be operating at altitude. The high levels of fitness is going to help us to do that. So when I'm talking about fitness or, or aerobic fitness, and essentially this is the ability of the body uh, to transport and, and use oxygen during physical activity. Again, in order to be able to access some of the energy that we have stored, um, basically, basically in fat, that reaction requires oxygen. Um, and that, ox that um, reaction is relatively slow, which is why um, we, uh, we tend to use uh, aerobic, or we use aerobic um, pathways during lower intensity activities where there's not a high speed demand on us. So aerobic uh, conditioning, aerobic fitness usually relates to activity that you can do for a relatively long period of time. So essentially over a minute and anything up to uh, a couple of hours. So that's what I'm talking about when we're, we're talking aerobic fitness. In terms of actual measure, uh, measurements of fitness, uh, VO2 max, this is the maximum amount of oxygen that you can use during intense physical activity. We measure, here, we measure it here in clinic and it's available for, for measure across um, a few of our UPMC sites. Uh, we measure it using a gas analyzer on a treadmill or a bike and it gives us a really accurate measure of how fit you are. Um, and the reason I put the picture of the, the biathlete here, um, so this is somebody who cross country skis and then, uh, and then shoots at a target. Um, these athletes are the, uh, the fittest on earth. You know, they, they, they live or born and, and grew up at usually high altitude um, and train in a very intense um, uh, endurance activity. So they have very, very high VO2 maxes. Um, but having some sort of measure of uh, your aerobic fitness is a good way to understand um, what sort of level you're at at the moment prior to your holiday, or even just for, for general health. Um, but it changes, okay? And this is one reason why um, it's a good idea to start understanding your own aerobic fitness. Um, these changes happen throughout our lives. So as we age, we tend to lose fitness levels. Um, and this is often dependent on the type of activity levels that we, uh, that we partake in. So if we play a lot of um, field sports during our uh, teens, 20s, early 30s, and we stop, then we don't have a, um, a, an activity in order to be able to uh, maintain our aerobic fitness. So we lose levels. If we're more um, uh, conditioning focused, so if, say, we're a runner or a cyclist or a triathlete, oftentimes we will maintain high levels of VO2 maxes um, to late 30s, early 40s. Um, but we lose fitness basically um, uh, based on the amount of training that we do. So if um, our activity levels change, we have different lifestyle changes, we take on study, we have busy periods at work or children get in the way, um, we, we lose fitness. If we have periods of illness, so we're in hospital for a couple of weeks, for example, or um, and a COVID would have had a big impact on this as well, then we lose fitness and it doesn't come back by itself. You know, your body gets used to what you give it and you need to, be able to, you need to train it in order to be able to recover those fitness qualities. There's some elements of our fitness is genetically determined by stuff like our, our size. So that contributes to our lung size and the size of our hearts. But we can all, we can all improve it. And I imagine there's very few of us who are um, engaged in the, the talk tonight um, uh, that has reached our, reached our peak. So we can definitely all improve. Um, but beyond um, skiing and, um, uh, I guess, moving into general health, maintaining uh, high levels of aerobic fitness is important. We know it reduces the risk of cardiac arrest and, and stroke. And so avoiding these type of illness events through our lifestyle is obviously um, very important. Um, it's incredibly important for weight management. Um, so exercise is often perceived as um, uh, being important for weight loss. It's actually the other way around. It has very little uh, bearing on the amount of weight we lose. That's all um, diet-based. Um, but it is really important for not putting weight on. So as soon as we stop aerobic conditioning, we tend to pile on the pounds. We know there are mental health benefits to aerobic training as well. Um, so, you know, we, people talk about the runner's high, but we have social elements, um, feeling good about our, our body and a, a kind of wider array of um, mental health changes off the back of physical activity. We feel better. We have increased energy levels. And, you know, as the reason we're here for the, the talk today, um, we have more enjoyment in our skiing. So how do you get fit? Well, first of all, you, you have to pick an activity. And we don't get fit by sitting down watching Netflix. So um, there are plenty to pick from. Um, I've just given a small list here um, between running, cycling, rowing, uh, spin classes, 
uh, group training. These could be kind of free weight type type classes so uh, boxer size, this type of stuff that a myriad of um, options in your, your local gym. Um, companies like Bike Row Ski, who are very conditioning focused, power walking, um, you know, rollerblading, uh, unicycling, um, whatever it is, anything that gets us a little bit out of breath. Um, and the reason I say you've got to pick an exercise, it has to be enjoyable as well. I'll come on to why that's important shortly. Then we broadly have to pick an intensity. So we have to figure out how hard we, we want to exercise at. And again, oftentimes I think this is driven by um, what we're comfortable doing. Some people prefer a bit of a blur and they'll reach instead for the, um, the high intensity interval training. That's the H-I-I-T there. Um, because they prefer to, um, to get very out of breath, get very hot and sweaty very quickly. Some people don't enjoy that um, and they prefer a steady state, lower intensity form of exercise going out for a longer time period. Um, but it's personal preference. And both of these intensities will improve your aerobic fitness. Um, but the most important one is, is picking one that you will do. And in terms of the frequency and the volume, um, one to two times a week and up to three hours is enough in order to be able to reduce, uh, reduce um, uh, uh, risk of um, cardiac episodes and stroke. Obviously, you can exercise for more than that, but as a bit of a baseline, if, if you're looking to try and improve health outcomes and get a little bit fitter, um, the, the actual requirement isn't, isn't that high. So in, in terms of exercise intensity, generally we measure this using heart rate. Now, um, a lot of wrist-worn devices will be able to give you a, a heart rate measure. And while it, it gets less accurate, the higher the intensity that you go, it should give you a pretty decent ballpark. Uh, if you do have access to a, a chest-worn um, uh, heart rate monitor with your, with your watch, then that's, that's a much more accurate version. Um, and essentially, we're looking at different training zones based on the percentage of your maximum heart rate. Now, in terms of building aerobic uh, conditioning, um, aerobic fitness, then zone one and zone two is really all you need. So relatively low intensities, quite low intensities there, 50 to 60, 60 70% of your maximum. Um, and provided we spend enough volume up to the three hours a week, then we're going we're gonna to get a little bit fitter. So you don't always have to exercise to, um, to very high levels where you're feeling very out of breath and fatigued in order to be able to, uh, to improve your fitness. And this leads then to, um, to the type of sessions that we can do. And again, like you're looking at a cascade in terms of intensity. So um, 30 minutes of a, a low intensity exercise, going out for a fast walk, a jog, a bike ride at zone one um, will get you fitter. And doing that over um, for multiple sessions over a long period of time helps you to stay fit. If we're a little bit tighter on time or we prefer to, um, uh, to be working at a slightly higher intensity, then the middle row there, four lots of four minute work with two minutes rest between repetitions and a short warm up, um, uh, will have you done in um, about the same time, about 30 minutes. Um, but working at a slightly higher intensity at zone three. Um, and then the final one, this is when we want a, a, a big blowout. So we're doing 45 seconds of high intensity work up at zone four or five, with 90 seconds rest between reps, and again, a, a short warm up. Now, all of those, um, those sessions will take a short period of time, but if we do them a couple of times a week, will help to uh, build your uh, aerobic fitness. And this is all doable a couple of times a week in the, in the run into your ski holiday. So we've got some idea of the sessions, but what is the true secret to getting and staying fit? Well, it's simple. It, it's consistency. I'm sure there's lots of um, that I'm uh, talking about today in the, in the session that um, isn't new to you. You all know that in order to be able to get and stay fit, you need to be able to do it over a, a longer period of time. But building consistency is essentially forming a habit and there's certain things that you can do in order to be able to help do that. So the first is to create a schedule, is to look at your week, see what you're normally doing and find a window where you can do this exercise. So work around your study, work around your work, work around the uh, picking the kids up um, and, and find a couple of windows a week where you can do the, the volume of exercise that you're looking to try and do. Then you want to set up a re reward structure. Forming habits is, is about creating positivity around the activity that you're doing. And if you're rewarded for doing it, that helps to build the habit. So it might be if you're looking to do two sessions a week um, uh, and you set out a, a month on your calendar, um, if you do your eight or nine or, or 10 sessions, depending on how the month falls, um, if you complete all of those sessions, then you might reward yourself with takeaway pizza, um, a trip to the cinema. Um, again, like you, you can pick the reward structure, um, but it will help to add buy-in to your, to your training. Accountability. Um, 
is, is often very effective. So this could be starting a, a training program or um, a training routine with somebody. So whether it's a partner, a sibling, a friend, um, even just engaging the, um, the services of a coach. Um, it actually feel, makes you feel a little bit sheepish if you, if you don't do it. But that accountability is, is often important for, for people and helps keep them on the line. And again, once that habit is formed, then you're more accountable to yourself necessarily than, than somebody else. Setting targets is also a good way to build consistency and drive and motivation. So it might be that you're looking to try and get a, a, five, a certain 5K time um, and achieve that. It might be that you're looking for a certain volume of training across a period of time, uh, across a year, across a month. And again, it can be very rewarding to hit those targets in the same way that you, if you have a to-do list and you cross off all the tasks, it feels good. That's what we're looking to try and do around your, uh, your fitness training. Some people's sociability is very important. So this is where um, uh, sports or activities like CrossFit have become um, uh, really popular because it's not just about the exercise, it's the, uh, the, the friendships uh, that are formed around it. Some of us aren't. Some people are happy jumping on a bike for an hour or two by themselves with uh, the headphones on or without headphones and just getting into their own headspace. Um, but if, if sociability is something that's important to you, it's very like, I think it's a good idea in order to be able to build this into your and um, into your training. Measurement and seeing progress again kind of fits in with the targets. Using the apps on the phone in order to be able to track your volume and your it, stuff like your resting heart rate is again another measure of fitness. Um, uh, Maybe the weight lifted if you're if you're using um, weight training in order to be able to to build a little bit of fitness. Anything that helps drive consistency. And then the final one, as I talked about, is is assessment. So if say for example you uh, you come in and have your VO2 max measured, you go away and train for eight to, to ten weeks and come back and remeasure, then you know first of all there's a bit of accountability. We have some targets, and then you can actually see in black and white that you've made some progress. And again, that helps to drive uh, drive some consistency. So in terms of some tips for enjoying your holiday, and um, hopefully I kind of bang the drum enough throughout the uh, throughout the talk here um, to do some aerobic fitness work in the lead in. Um, even if it's two weeks out, if you get four sessions in, you're going to be a little bit fitter and you're going to find your holiday a little bit easier. Um, if possible, try and use mixed methods. So I know I haven't really touched on strength work today, um, but if you can do some fitness and some strength work, it's going to help you um, tolerate the demands of uh, skiing much more. And again, you'll get more enjoyment out of your holiday. Next, I'd say take regular breaks, especially and one if you're, you're tired, sometimes a little bit hungover, but um, taking regular breaks is going to be important. Um, that's going to lead to fewer mistakes. And if skiing at very high intensity, again, it's just worth bearing in mind that um, your, your body's going to, it's going to take its toll on its body again, particularly towards the end of the week. Um, so uh, taking regular enough, uh, breaks to recover is going to be very important. This is quite a specific one to skiing. Um, but when you get your, when you get your skis, like if you, uh, if you don't have your own, you're renting them. Um, or even if you do have your own, you have them set up, just use the recommended DIN settings on the binding. So a DIN setting is how tight the boot is held into the ski. These are set to an international standard. If you go out of this and, it's just, and you, you injure, then any insurance will be invalidated, but it's also safer. The ski has to release in order to be able to, um, uh, uh, to not put the, the rotation loads on the, the knee. Um, and it's, it's done based on your height, your weight, and your, your ski ability. Now, if you crank those up and the ski doesn't release and, and you fall, um, then you're at serious risk of a, 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 bad, a bad particular knee injury there. From a nutrition perspective, eat breakfast. No, you don't always feel like it again, depending on um, how the day before has gone. But that's important to make sure we have the um, uh, the fuel in order to be able to, to tolerate the training demand or the, the activity demand. And then hydrate throughout the day and have a little bit of a plan for it. I know it's challenging sometimes on the hill to um, to figure out uh, what cafe you can stop off and you know get in charge eight, eight euro for a, a cup of coffee and a, a small glass of tap water on the side. So if you can carry a bottle of water or a camel back with you, something like that, and we'll be able to make sure you, um, you stay hydrated, um, uh, definitely do. Um, be wary of fatigue. So as I said, um, towards the end of the week, but at the end of the day, and then also changing snow conditions. So as particularly if we have a better um, uh, conditions this year and a little bit more snow, you'll start to get very mogully conditions towards the end of the day with, uh, with ice in between those moguls. Um, that's going to be much more challenging often than the skiing at the beginning of the day. So again, um, take regular breaks, make sure you're fueled at lunchtime. And if you start to feel tired, it's okay to, um, uh, to pull in for the end of the day. And then ski at your own pace at level. 
Okay, and again, I know this is challenging depending on who you're skiing with, um, but you'll massively reduce your your risk of injury and increase your enjoyments because you won't be as tired um, when you ski at your own at a pace you're comfortable at and a level and um, intensity that you're comfortable at. The final thing then is for you uh, to enjoy your holiday. Um, if you have any questions at all, I'm, I'm free to answer them. Neil and Brian, thanks very much for those interesting talks for the questions that are coming in. So we're just going to start on the first one now about um, should you strap an old ACL injury while skiing? Um, I might start with that one. Um, so I suppose there's very limited evidence to suggest that strapping is going to reduce your likelihood of sustaining a further injury. But oftentimes people feel that the strapping gives them a bit of extra confidence. So there's no harm in doing it. And if it does give you extra confidence, you're more likely to ski more normally and less defensively. So I would say it's no harm, but don't rely on it to reduce injury. Don't let it increase your risk, I would say, of, or your risk taking um, um, when you're skiing. Okay, good. I suppose that goes on to there's another one here about if you have a weak knee or you know you have a small wear and tear with the osteoarthritis, do you recommend wearing knee braces? Neil, do you? Um, yeah, I mean, it'd be quite quite similar. Um, you, you don't necessarily want to be trying to rely on an external uh, support yeah. um, to, uh, to give you the, the best protection when, when you're doing any activity, really. Um, I'm always going to be a little bit biased towards the exercise side of things anyway. So um, the, the stronger you can get your leg uh, prior to, uh, to undertaking or um, uh, partaking in a sport like skiing, uh, the better. And as Brian said, if it gives you a little bit more confidence um, when, you're, uh, when you're on the hill, um, yeah. then yeah, work away with the um, the knee support. Okay. Uh, some of the here, Joanne Stone, she saw her meniscus skiing in February 2023, so last year, and was told snowboarding would be better for her knee if she was to try going again. Would you agree with this, that snowboarding may be less severe than skiing? Um, yeah, I think in just in general, you're in snowboards, just the position your feet are in, you're, there's less twisting in terms of um, the rotation, which is a very much higher risk for injuring a meniscus. Um, you tend to flex your knees a bit more, your body weight shifts where you're leaning forward in your toes or in your heels. Um, so you have less risk of injuring your your um, meniscus. But having said that, going up skiing is risky in itself because the ground is slippy, you've got big boots on. So there is increased risk than you would just in normal everyday life. Um, but it's certainly lessened with snowboarding, definitely. Okay, good, thanks. Uh, after knee replacement, when would you recommend going skiing? Um, well, I suppose you just have to see about how functional you are in everyday life once again. I think that, you know, nowadays we're doing knee replacements on people who are younger, but also um, more elderly people are, are continuing to ski, which is fantastic. So you really need a good range of motion. As um, Neil has said earlier, you need good strength, which is, is, is really important for skiing. So you just want to make sure you're fully optimized from your rehabilitation perspective. So typically you find within the first six months, people would struggle. So anytime after that, but provided that you're, you're pain-free, you don't have any swelling in your knee and you've got good strength and you can get that tested, which is very effective to, com to compare it to the opposite side. Yeah. Neil, any advice on that one? Um, no, uh, not specifically. Um, just the same, rather than um, necessarily just thinking about a specific timeline. Um, uh, again, everyone's progress through rehabilitation is is, is very different. Um, so depending on your strength, I mean, there's certain things you'd probably want to be able to do first, like, you know, tolerate going for a hill walk um, yeah. would be a, a, a kind of a, a, a cutoff activity, making it up and down hill. Um, if you struggle to do that, then then skiing is going to be a step up from that. So you might be a struggle, and it's not just necessarily the uh, the time on piste um, that is is also the, the the big issue. It's getting around town when there's there's snow and ice and walking around with ski boots. We kind of have to really think about the the whole the whole yeah. picture. But you want to be very confident on feet before you before you go away. Okay, thank you. Um, some of his post ACL again six months. Uh, we've talked about wearing knee supports. Should you be going skiing again six months after ACL reconstruction? Uh, as I said in the, the one of the first or second slide of my talk, that if yeah. you could devise a device to rupture an ACL, you couldn't get much better than a ski. So yeah. a new ACL at six months is still quite a vulnerable stage. And um, so I would say it would not be advisable. 
and um, perhaps if you were skiing in the Olympics and it was your last opportunity, you might chance it. Um, but I think for a recreational skier, it's probably a little bit too early, I would think. Um, okay. I don't know if you agree, Neil, but we wouldn't be recommending it, no. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd, I'd agree. Um, it's both from a structural perspective, but the majority of ACLs we would test at six months still have relatively large uh, deficits between legs. So the, the strength isn't even back to full level on the, the operated leg by that stage in, in most people. So um, I, I'd be advising the six months to be a little bit on the early side. Okay, so a question here from Nick Murphy, Neil, for you. Can you recommend particular strength exercises? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's any, any number you could use. Um, any form of squat is going to be very effective. Um, and, and being very um, conscious of the what we call the eccentric phase. So as, you, as you're lowering during the movements, um, to be very controlled and, and, and on purpose quite slow. Um, you'd be training the muscles specifically for skiing then. Um, the other thing you could do is try and bias one leg. So an exercise such as a Bulgarian split squats, um, again, using it in the same way would be uh, would be an important one there as well. Okay, thanks, Neil. Um, does skiing increase the likelihood of getting osteoarthritis? Um, I would say no. Um, it's, uh, well, I suppose predominantly because it's something that as Irish people, we don't do very often, maybe two weeks a year. Yeah. Um, so in general, it's, it's a downhill activity. So your your weights are certainly go on the front of your knees. So people tend to come back with sore knees or if people who have patellofemoral arthritis is probably exacerbated somewhat by skiing because your, your pressure is on your kneecaps. Um, but I would not think it, it increases the risk of arthritis. Certainly if you have a fall or a, a traumatic injury and you develop an injury to your joints, you might have an increase of post-traumatic arthritis, but not per se as a, as a, as a recreation activity. I wouldn't think so. Okay. And some says does the most likely the skiing injuries change depending on your age? Um, um oh, go ahead, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was I was I was gonna say it's it's probably more likely um based on the type of skiing you do. Yeah. Um so the uh the faster you ski, um then uh I guess the, the harder you fall, basically. If you if you if you take a tumble, you're more likely to suffer from impact injuries. Um uh, if you venture off piste as well same thing um uh crashing into objects trees uh rocks and that sort of thing becomes um uh more uh more frequent um i guess it, the collisions are probably going to be the most common ones uh, particularly on crowded pistes so um checking the checking the area when you're skiing becomes um and being really aware around of, of what's going on around you um is is important advice and then um following the um uh, the guidelines from the uh, on the ski hill as well about being cautious about where you stop not in the, not in the middle of uh, the mountain off to one side um, not just off the uh, the edge of um, uh, steep pitches and uh, and stuff like that is is probably the most most sensible kind of injury prevention um, advice um, uh, and then again I, I don't want to scare everyone with the ACL side of things but, you know the vast majority of people ski without any ACL injury but um, again, with the uh, the rougher the, the snow becomes, um, you introduce fatigue, then you increase the likelihood of uh, those type of injuries with the skiing mistakes, basically. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Neil, another question for you here. How do you rate swimming as a form of exercise? I noticed you didn't include it in your possible forms of exercise. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it, well, it wasn't a pop-up swimming. It was a, uh, a careless omission. Um, uh, anything that gets you out, I mean, I, I don't like swimming myself, so that would be maybe one reason why uh, why it's not in there. But um, anything that that's, uh, you're going to do to get you out of breath on a frequent uh, frequent basis is, um, is is a great form of exercise. Um, so if if swimming's your uh, your weapon of choice, um, then yeah, it's it's a great exercise. Yeah, okay. Uh, Brian, sea, to... sea swimming might also acclimatize you to the cold, so oh, uh, there might yeah. be a advantage. <laughs> Good one. Uh, some ACL nine months ago, they're still have struggling up and down the stairs and um, doing all their rehab. So, do you think that well, you probably won't be able to have this completed, but they'd be able to ski in 2025? So, they're nine months um, now post ACL. Yeah, so anterior knee pain is is what typically uh, is the reason for people to struggle going downstairs. Mm. So it's not uncommon after an ACL injury, even though that's not a typical site that people injure as part of the mechanism of injury. But it's an er area that the cartilage, particularly in women, as we find it, that it gets a bit softer under the kneecap and can get a bit sore in the post-operative period. One of the things that's really important is to 
maintain your quadriceps strength, but don't do it at the expense of causing a lot of pain. So just doing specific exercises that can, you know, target to have the uh, quadriceps, but don't kind of put them into a position where you're you're irritating the patellofemoral joint is important. But certainly it's not uncommon to get. It typically settles down. And given that that's 13 months away, I say if, if that person were to, you know, liaise with a good physiotherapist, a strength and conditioning coach and go through a program, there's no, shouldn't be no problem um, yeah. skiing in 2025. Good. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, question here. Um, I had a HDL, which is a high tibial osteotomy, uh, successfully yeah. with us in 2017. Now, the other knee's not great. However, I am active and relatively fit. Do you think I'd still be okay for skiing? Um, absolutely. The, mm. There's no contraindication with skiing with a high tibial osteotomy. Um, I think, you know, if, you're, if the other knee is, is bothersome, you just perhaps to get that a little investigation to see even a basic x-ray to see how that is. Um, but also it, if the person's relatively fit, they probably need to work a little bit on their, their specific fitness prior to embarking on skiing because it could be a pretty miserable holiday if they pull up sore during the during the trip. Yeah, okay. Last question is kind of a, a diet question. Does high protein diet stay strong on the slope? Does anyone want to answer that one? <laughs> um yeah is this to to be able to get away with the the fondue mm -hmm. um yeah like it not necessarily to stay strong but certainly um to, to help recover uh mm -hmm. definitely if there's any um any muscle soreness after a day after a day skiing then yeah um having a high protein diet is really beneficial for that um as i think as, as i mentioned in the the talk the main thing is the preparation beforehand so the stronger you fit you, you are going in um the uh the better you're going to be on the day um or on the holiday um so yeah uh, eat the protein um but don't depend on it okay neil and brian thanks very much for joining us tonight just to remind you for everyone that if you want to watch this event it is on the website and all our events um are there on the website too under public talk so there's skiing golf hiking walking running as well there and all our speakers will be there as well so uh, then we will send out a survey. It's really important if you can send us back your information. We will use it in the future to help us um, decide what talks to do and anything you suggest would be helpful. So thank you again for joining us tonight. Thank you.